Joe Biden is taking a huge risk. The new US president is making reform of America's outdated immigration system one of his key policy goals. Critics, though, say any hint of a more humane approach will only trigger a new surge of immigrants heading for America's southern border. Meanwhile, the EU is taking a tougher approach, one that observers say amounts to keeping migrants out of Europe, whatever it costs. So, on to the point we ask US immigrants immigration reform, Biden's alternative to Fortress Europe. Thanks very much indeed for joining us here on To The Point. Well, my guests here in the studio are Ana Maria Alvarez, a migration expert from Costa Rica. She says what Joe Biden can learn from Europe is that inclusion needs to be a key element of the narrative. Also with us is Alan Posner from the German daily Die Welt. He thinks if you want right-wing populists to rule Europe, all you have to do is open the borders. And a very warm welcome, too, to Joseph Hutchinson, US lawyer and activist. His opinion, Biden's ambitious plans are doomed to fail in the anti-democratic US Senate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got so much to talk about. Anna, let's begin with you. As I said, Joe Biden has made reform of America's immigration system one of the central planks of his politics for, the, for, for, for years to come now. Uh, are you surprised? I'm not surprised because a lot of organised groups from the civil society and grassroots organizations made him go to power today and he owned it to them. Many of them were organizations and grassroots um, um, uh, organizing groups, yeah. which are, you know, in the basis of migrant, uh, migrant populations as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised he owned it to them. It was part of his narrative throughout the campaign. Um, I'm just basically surprised that he started his first day with this ambitious plan, which they essentially won. right now... They won. a huge risk. Absolutely. Yeah. But they were not prepared and they're not prepared. And we have seen it in, uh, been unfolding this, in these days, that they're not prepared. They're still planning and they're still uh, working on that. OK, we'll talk about how they're, uh, how they're not prepared in just a second. Uh, Joseph, Joseph Hutchinson, immigration is one of the most diverse issues in the US, one of the diver most uh, divisive issues in the world, I think. What makes it so polarising? Um, I think, unfortunately, that we've let right-wing populists control the narrative. Um, so, you know, people don't like data or facts anymore. Um, when you look at the data, immigration is a net positive for pretty much every society you look at. Um, wages increase, um, people do better, there's more diversification. Immigrants uh, generally have either the social capital or just the gumption to come and start new businesses. So um, immigration is a net positive, but that's like a wonky detail that most people don't understand. It's easier to, you know, resort to this fear. And um, I, also, I, I want to be very careful when I say that. I understand the fear, right? So people are afraid for their security. They're afraid for their livelihoods. But I think what we need to understand is the people coming to, you know, I say Europe or the United States, those are the same things they want. They want to be free from that fear mm. and they want to have the same security we understand here. So what we're lacking is the empathy and really the understanding contextually why are these people leaving. Well, the, the Biden administration is going to do it all so differently. One senior official says, quote, uh, they're going to restore compassion and order to our immigration system, correct the divisive, inhumane and immoral policies of the last four years. It's a tall order. Well, uh, Donald Trump broke the country, <laughs> um, so there's just a lot to fix. Mm -hmm. Alan, Donald Trump broke the country. Yeah, I, w I, would, uh, I would agree. Though, um, looking at the numbers of immigration, I mean, what we're talking about, they actually didn't go down as much as Donald Trump promised they would go down. So, I mean, he, he, the, the worst thing about Trump was his rhetorics, right? And... Um, and uh, you know, in many ways, he was just continuing what the Obama administration started. I mean, fence building, that wasn't his invention, right? Obama started that. And so Biden's changed the rhetoric, right? Uh, uh, but how much will really change remains to be seen. I mean, what Biden's saying now is word for word what the European Union has been saying all along. And, you know, if you listen to von der Leyen or anyone, commission president, they will you know, they'll sign on the dotted line on what, on what Biden's just said. So the question is really what actually happens. And it remains for any government 
they have to control the borders and control who comes in, who stays out. That's yeah, a fact but, but of life. What you referred to already is Biden has changed the rhetoric, but that is, he, he's adopting, you could say, a softer tone. I think that might be one way of, of, of describing it, yeah? <laughs> but it has meant there has been a surge towards the border already. Absolutely, and, and I agree with you. I mean, sometimes, I mean, the change needed to happen from a narrative perspective, but there's so much to be done. For example, it's very important that we understand that the first day um, when he entered to the White House, he uh, delivered these executive orders, but there's one executive order regarding the migration um, protection protocol, which was set by Trump. He said, we're going to review it. He mm -hmm. has never said we're going to change it. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what I am very concerned, because actually in two days ago in, 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 in the press briefing, we heard that they were going to invite Roberta jo uh, Jacobson, which is the new uh, chief in command who's going to take care of the of The, the ambassador soldier. for these issues. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, it, it makes me feel like they're still not uh, aligned with what they're going to say. What is the plan? What's going to be the what's going to be the plan? What's going to be the 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 actions to be unfolded in the, in the southern border? And mm -hmm. we still don't know that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And critics say that uh, this is you know there's a pandemic on. This is not the time to be revamping the system or tweaking the system. What do you say, Joseph? Um, this is <clears throat> exactly the time because so I, I would disagree that there's now a surge because um, he's in office. I think. Uh, there's this natural pressure that pushes people to the United States. Um, but especially in light of the pandemic, what we've realized, and, you know, I'm frankly shocked the United States with their vaccination campaign is doing so well. What we're realizing is you need quick, decisive action. You're shocked, impressed. That's I'm impressed, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Uh, you, you, you just mentioned Roberta Jackson and uh, the, uh, no Jacobson, the, Jacobson. And, and yeah. the, the woman who's responsible for uh, Biden policy to, uh, on the southern border. Yeah, mm -hmm. she said what we're trying to do is walk the walk and chew the gum at the same time. That we're trying to be sort of kind and friendly, but saying to people, stay away from the border. It's not yes. going to work, is it? Um, <laughs> probably not. I mean. Uh, as you say, people are coming um, for reasons which are beyond the control of the US government. I mean, the terrible situation in Venezuela due to the mismanagement of the socialist uh, government there, the situation in, 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 in Central America due to, again, lots of corrupt governments there and gangsterism, the situation sure, even in Mexico due to the drug cartels. I mean, they killed like something like 10,000 people only last year. Mm. Uh, these are all things that Biden can't can't control. So, so I would uh, would agree that that people are going to come, mm -hmm. whatever he says. And that's when I think and I say that they are not prepared because when when you have a narrative that is unifying and telling people that you're going to fix the immigration laws and you're gonna not being open borders because it has never been a narrative, but you're going to fix what was done in the past. You're essentially not considering that when people in Central America or the ones waiting in Mexico are listening to it with hope. So these people is not like us, economical migrants, saying like we cannot just wait to go to the embassy before we get the visa to come to Europe because of pandemic issues. These people are fleeing persecution. They are and they are not secured. They are, they are outside with nothing to eat. So you cannot tell these people, stay away and wait, hold on until we fix something or we create a plan for you. So then why the urgency? Why not fixing the narrative at the beginning and promising people with a lot of hope. OK, picking up on that point, in recent years, tens of thousands of people from Central America and Mexico have tried to make their way into the US, many ending up stranded in refugee camps along the border. Uh, the Trump administration tried to close the border altogether. Now, under Joe Biden's leadership, that policy is slowly beginning to change. They come from Honduras, Venezuela, Guatemala, fleeing violence and poverty in their homeland. For years, many have lived in camps like this in Mexico, on the border to their dream destination, the US. With Biden, hope and movement are returning to a stalled situation. Volunteers like Sister Norma accompany small groups across the border. Now there is a possibility for a person who is politically persecuted and who fears for their life to have their case reconsidered. And that also means crossing onto American soil, where they're assisted by aid organizations. Meanwhile, more families are coming, attracted by the prospect of fair treatment, but the application process is long. While the U.S. needs migrants as labor force, whether these people will receive asylum or residency is far from certain. 
Will refugees soon have a chance to stay in the US under Biden? Good question, Anna. Your personal response to seeing those pictures? Well, I mean, I'm from Central America. This is an um, impotent feeling that creates. Um, you feel powerless. Powerless, totally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing is, yes, it will exist and yes, they will reform. I, I trust and I believe that this is what is going to happen because, again, I have so much faith and so much uh, respect towards the organization and grassroots organization that has pushed this further in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so it will eventually happen. It just takes so much time. And in the meantime, uh, for example, the kids that are still waiting in detention centers, uh, they call it in Spanish, um, yeleras, which is freezers. You know, and so I just want to uh, insist in this. In the meantime, all this is fixed. It's the lives of humans and kids still mm. in these detention centers. Joseph, as an activist, I just wonder, I saw a sentence this week which I thought was quite interesting because it seemed to me to describe a, a balance in the situation that is a cruel balance, but perhaps a realistic one. The sentence goes like this. To let some people in, you need to keep many others out. If you see it as a, there's only so much pie, and if I have less pie, then um, I'm losing. So what we need, we need to come realize that we have the resources to take care of everyone. Um, everyone in the whole wide everyone world. Everyone in the whole wide world, because we have nowhere else to go. If we don't take care of everyone in this whole wide world, True. what are we doing and why are we doing it? So we're trapped in this mindset of, you know, these, uh, my little nation state guarding my little resources and I can't do it, but we have the technology. We understand technology now. Technology flows across borders. We have the capacity to track people moving across borders. We don't need, we, we can have uh, these open borders in Europe because we have the ability to track people as they're moving across. If we can send goods and services and capital across borders, why can't we afford the same to people? It's an attractive vision. Yeah, and I don't think technology is a problem, right? We, um, we can, of course, we can track people where they go, um, but data protection laws in uh, Europe say you can't. We even that problem with our COVID vaccine tracking device on our mobile phones, which, people, which you know people don't have to have, unlike in, shall we say, China, where they're forced to. And um, and I, for one, am in favour of as much individual freedom as possible in Europe is, a, is a, not a fortress, by the way. It is an island of freedom and a sea of unfreedom. And I don't want to have to restrict that. For instance, with the technological devices you're talking about, uh, tracking everybody where they're going, I would prefer to be able to go across to, 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 to France or to, to Poland tomorrow and nobody knows I'm there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and nobody cares. And, and I can, you know, unless I start using my credit card or going online, then, then, then Facebook or whatever no, 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 you know, knows who I am. But, you know, the government isn't following what I'm doing. And it's this freedom that I want to protect. And, and I have to balance that against letting in a whole, you know, I mean, how many people can you let in and still keep this freedom? It sounds like I'm defending a privilege, and I am. I'm defending the privilege of freedom. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm very sorry, but if, if the alternative is, oh, let everyone in, have them on a marker, see where they're going, then no, thank you. I'd rather not have that George Orwellian state. I'd rather have the situation we have now. The thing is, this is happening, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, that's and, happening, and, and, I and agree. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, what I like about what you said is that why are we using this technology in the wrong hands? So let me rephrase it. Migration is a business, but not for the right purposes. It's a business because technology, uh, technolog technological companies, weapon industry, even face recognition, it's been in the way of creation for what we know about Frontex. Perhaps we will talk about that later. So my point is, there's the European billions. Border Control Organization. Exactly. There's mm -hmm. billions invested. There's billions of money being invested, which basically essentially enables the right wing and a very conservative narrative to continue and controlling us. So that will eventually happen. And technology, it's already been deployed, but for the wrong direction. When, when we talk about migrants, and I want to pick up something that you said, the problem of facts not being... 
uh, taking into account anymore, um, which is a big problem, is that we are not seeing that migrants contribute way more than what, for example, Europe is spending in controlling them. But since we don't care about data, then uh, that's when technology in these companies spend much more money in making their business themselves. No, and I'm so glad you pointed out the facial recognition technology. So the world where you could travel to Paris or Rome and no one knew where you were, that's gone. Um, the moment you're at a train station, the moment you're at a, an airport, these major hubs of transportation, um, and we need that in the fight against terrorism. So on the one hand, we understand that we need this in the fight against terrorism, but we don't understand that we could be using it to have much more humane borders. Okay, can I just move away from uh, the, 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 the debate about technology migration is also about it's about politics it's about economics and it's about culture tell me a little bit about that um, so yeah so that's where I think you know in the United States we really see ourselves as a nation of immigrants um, it would be better if we also saw ourselves as a nation of colonial conquest but I think we're kind of slowly getting there as the generation shifts um, in a nation U very troubled by racism as well uh, we Europeans can learn so much about you know how constructive uh, policy on racism from America <laughs> But we're, we? also, we're, also very, we? we're also extremely <laughs> troubled by what we see and hear, obviously. Right. So I think, yeah, the, the issue with Europe is Europe still has this concept of itself. Um, you know, these nation states, these ethnicities, I'm French, I'm German, we're white French, we're white German, without understanding that the concept of Europe uh, historically was more around the Mediterranean. So you have people on the Mediterranean now mm -hmm. who are no longer considered European, but historically in Hellenic culture, were. So the issue is where do you start looking, right? And I think European culture right now has been stuck since the age of conquest and exploration. Okay. Go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 I just <laughs> wanted to say yes. Um, yes. I mean, uh, I just don't want to add more because I'm not European. And uh, I don't know, I would like to hear from, from, from one from Europe. What, what do you think about this? Because I, from a migrant uh, perspective, point of view, when I came here in 2015 and then I see all this welcoming narrative and all the narrative that, you know, I see happening now in the United States being super diplomatic and super correct when you refer to migrants. And yet you see that not much has been advanced towards real inclusion. So is that the Europe that... OK, we're on <laughs> Europe and most people in the EU seem to have tacitly at least uh, to, a, to have agreed to look the other way while official agencies do the dirty work of keeping immigrants out of the continent. That has led to the cruel practice known as pushbacks. Please, please anyone help us, please. please. Cries for help from refugees off the Greek coast. Their inflatable boats are constantly being attacked by massed assailants and rendered unseaworthy. Both European border agency Frontex as well as the Greek government deny that such a legal action is taking place. But there is video footage to prove it. In the southern Mediterranean, meanwhile, EU-funded Libyan militias are threatening the work of sea rescuers like CI. More and more refugees are now taking the dangerous route toward the Canary Islands. For most, this is the end of the line. The situation is even worse in the Balkans. In the Bosnian Lipa camp, 30 refugees share one tent. Most want to move on quickly to the EU. Inshallah, we try again and again because Croatia push back, we are go again. We push back, we are go again. Is the EU keeping out refugees at all costs? And are people like us, EU citizens, Alan, prepared to look the other way? There's a, was that a caricature that I, the, the, that I just said just now? Or are we willing to look away while the dirty work is done for us? Well, your, 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 your film was very uh, uh, t uh, biased. Uh, the fact is... These things happen, and they shouldn't happen, right? Let's put, let's, and yes, they, due to COVID, among other things, they don't get the, the attention they deserve, right? That mustn't happen. At the same time, what your film didn't say is that hundreds of thousands make it to Europe every year. They are processed in an in a, in a, in a orderly fashion. Uh, about 90% of them apply for asylum, and they don't get it because, you know, and then they go to a court and 30% of the decisions against them are then reversed by the court, which is, means that things are working in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And also talking about Frontex, 
basically, Frontex has saved since its inception around about 26, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, right? Fished them out of the water, uh, saved them from, from people, smugglers, fought against pirates and that kind of thing. And I think it's a mixed bag, right? But if you... Well, let's it, hear the other side of the argument. Then, yeah, well, I know, um, be, 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 before we... We heard it in the film, didn't we? I mean, the fact is we are... And I just want to say one thing. If you had been as long in... I mean, when I came to Germany in, in, in the 60s, right, as an, as an English-speaking migrant, I was treated like, you know... You know, it, and, and, and at that time, no one could imagine that would that we today we'd have something like the welcome culture. I mean, we've we aren't we haven't understood that we're a nation of immigrants the way the United States has since at least John F. Kennedy. So it's been you know, and obviously it's going to take some time before that seeps down. In, 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 I mean, you have to hand it to the Germans with something like 2015, it would have been unimaginable only 10 years before. Point taken. Anna. That's true. It's working to a certain extent. And yes, there is a much more welcoming culture than before. As I said, in 2015, when I arrived here, I was impressed and I've never seen anything like that from a human rights perspective. Such a welcoming attitude. Two million volunteers, mainly Germans or Europeans, welcoming um, asylum seekers. Yet, the problem is that it got a stock somewhere between 2016 and 2017, and we know what happened, politically speaking, in places like Germany. Um, but the This was the fear and panic that Joe talked about earlier. This was You said you understand the fear that people feel. I think that's you're referring to the same thing there? Yes, exactly. Yeah. People saw too many people flooding into this country yeah. and then got afraid. And it created an entire opposition, uh, which was there, but not that active, but now it's very active and it's very out there. So the problem with, with what's happening afterwards is like, in 2015, I saw this hope and I saw this welcoming attitude. But somehow it's been changing a lot over the last years. And there is desperation. We still have how many people? More than 30,000 people are still stuck in Greece with no hopes of what's going to happen with them. Many of them, actually 4,000 of them, are young people in the age of school. So whether they continue or they just let send them home, it's just that we need to make a, a decision soon. And regarding Frontex, I just cannot say anything good about this, unfortunately. I mean, I work with organizations that are right now on the edge, in the verge to be criminalized for 20 years in sentences for saving lives. And uh, only, it, it's just, it's just very powerless how it feels to really express how people are feeling out there. So it's not about me or what about you anymore. I mean, even the organizations that I was running, now I hand it over to younger um, generations because I have hope in the same way that it's happening in the United States with young people changing and working tireless to, tireless to change the system, that it will happen here as well. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be in the hands of many of us. I would let it to the younger generations that they decide what, what's the future that they want to have. You lean forward as though you were about to say something, but I'm... I... Look, look, one of the big differences between the United States and Europe is the neighbourhood. Uh, you do not have, among the hundreds of thousands going north to the United States, um, a, a percentage of terrorists. Uh, we do. Our neighbourhood is Syria. We, uh, uh, people, come, the, the, the guy in the, in, in the film coming from Pakistan, state sponsor of terrorism, right? I'm not saying he's a terrorist. You know, but amongst those coming from Pakistan, from Iraq, from Syria, uh, even from Morocco, across from Libya, there is a percentage of terrorists and they have to be screened out, right? And, um, and Frontex is doing a very good job with that. And the reason why there is a problem with some of these activities, Sea Watch, for instance, is that they don't do it um, in, a, in a good way. And that's one of the problems why there is this... Uh, these illegal boats coming from, from, from Turkey and, and landing in Greece is when they get on board, we don't know where they're going. So it's, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but we have to deal with realities. We're not living in an island. We're living in a very dangerous neighborhood. We used to think it's only Israel, right? When they said our neighborhood is dangerous. Now we realize that States, we, we realize that in fact, okay, Europe yeah. is, is not the old Europe of the Greeks around the Mediterranean, because half of that is occupied by, well, right. Joseph. And yet, um, to conflate terrorism with immigration um, makes I'm this far too simple. I'm not conflating it. I mean, 
you know, the, the issue that we have is homegrown terrorism, so to speak, right? So uh, mm -hmm. keeping people out is not going to keep us safe. And that's what we have to understand. So I definitely agree. We need to be screening people, but we need to okay. be screening people by either letting them reach our shores or going to where they are. <laughs> we've run out of time, I'm afraid. It's been a great debate, great guests. Yeah, uh, we've been looking at immigration policy on either side of the Atlantic, Joe Biden's new administration, their policy. If we've given you plenty of food for thought, and I trust we have, come back next time round. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss.